Great. Thank you very much, Claire, and um, thank you to everyone. This has been great input. My colleagues here who have spoken on the high-level panel, I don't have to go too much into that, but four quick points because I'm conscious of the time and we really want to not miss the opportunity of hearing you. Um, that This being the first real concrete output um, since Rio uh, towards the post-2015, and, and the SG <coughs> certainly welcomes this in, in its entirety and hopes that um, you know, we'll be able to keep the momentum on these key messages that we're finding such a huge amount of consensus on, bank them and really make sure that we uh, keep them alive through the ho whole process. But it also gives us an opportunity to take stock of those concerns that you've had and how we can reinforce them as this input goes to um, really feeding uh, a critical part of the Secretary General's report for September. Personally, it's been an incredible privilege because um, I think the hallmark and the success of what we've done so far is to prove that outreach works. Um, it works beyond just listening, <laughs> that we did try the very best that we could um, to reflect um, some of those concerns and the positions that people had. And while I still know that there's, um, there are gaps there, um, I'm enthused because we've got another three months to go and listening to this and getting this as right as we can, keeping the ambition, as one panel member said, is it possible that the SG's report um, can lift to a, a higher ambition? Um, we're, all we're all sort of conscious, too, that we, we need to be practical about it. Um, certainly, I think the report itself as well, uh, talking about leadership, uh, we had dedicated leadership in this. This is the first time I've been in a number of panels, and to find three, two heads of state and a PM really dedicated to this with, with teams that work 24-7 behind it, I think can't be underestimated, and it's a good uh, way, I think, of going forward on panels that perhaps have had... Um, reports that just remained on the, on the shelf. But I think the members as well, the members of this panel were absolutely committed. We had many who said that we want to go beyond the rooms like this of, of interacting with people and go out into the field and get those voices back. Really difficult, but it did happen. And I talk about this because I think um, certainly going forward, the SG's report needs to keep that space open uh, for this dialogue, which seems to be fast closing in many, many places. Um, in terms of the content, I'd like to just say that, you know, for us, what we welcome s coming out of this is that we can say we've got a fist of five and we can power through with that. Um, if we look at all those uh, five elements of really the universality, better defining it because even the feedback now has said, what do you mean by universality and you've missed this, but this bit and it's not so good for, for our LDCs, um, I think we, we have to pay attention to uh, communicating that better. Uh, sustainable development, are we going to remain in silos on it? Are we actually going to integrate that? Are we going to be fit for purpose for it? Many questions around it. The fact that we can't go back to less than universality is a huge, um, I think, uh, 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 step forward in what we're about to do. Um, putting governance on the agenda. I mean, this has been key to why many of the gains have not been sustained. Um, and we really need to see uh, more uh, tangibly for, for those that will invest in this at country level and hold, it, uh, hold everybody's feet to the fire internationally, um, something up there on that. And, and the other two, of course, economic transformation in a very real way. How does that not leave anyone behind? Um, and uh, then the global partnership that, that, that puts all of this together. I think another part of this report that's really important is that we won't be talking about post-2015 if not for the MDGs. Glass full glass half empty, whatever it is, we, we have a starting point and we have to transition. It won't be about saying we're going to finish them in 2015 and then there's a new agenda, there is a transition. Many of the existing challenges will have to be carried forward um, um, on that agenda and, and how we do that is going to be incredibly important um, and putting, as we say, people, going past citizens, let me just say that because that's one thing I learned in the last nine months, citizens don't include all people. Um, and, and the people part of this is one that means inclusive and, and, and leaving no one behind uh, and getting that balance right with the planet. Um, to do that, I think one major ask here, and this is something we can do before 2015, is the data revolution. There's sufficient technology. We have to have a baseline before 2015, and so I think that's incredibly important. Just to, to stop off at the process, um, we see this as, an, as I said, an incredible important part of an input to, to the 2015 um, deadline. Um, this is uh, us winding down on this, but intergovernmental processes actually ratcheting up the open working group um, on the SDGs, the innovative financing, certainly the high level political forum, which will talk to the coherence and coordination of sustainable development within the system. And then um, very importantly, the conversation around the technologies beyond access to transfer um, as a means of implementation. Um, the special event in September, I think, will be um, a watershed, which hopefully member states will approve recommendations that give better clarity and a roadmap to how we move forward 
um, so that one can engage in a much more concrete way, milestone by milestone, to the summit that we hope to have in 2015. <laughs> um, I think that uh, we, we certainly would welcome now uh, keeping this momentum. Uh, this is going to be a member state uh, negotiation at the end of the day. We think that um, more emphasis and, and uh, uh, I think uh, um, engagement at the country level, regional levels, to get that um, coherence so the messaging is heard from the countries to, um, to, the, to the international level, to our PRs in, in New York. Um, th this is going to be um, one that says, yes, a universal agenda, you'll see the goals, but you'll see often that we illustrated the targets need to be country specific, and that's recognizing people are not at all at the same place, um, and that there has to be a response to that uh, that, that, is, uh, that is very real. Um, I'm just going to end with, somebody asked me, what was I hearing um, since that happened? Uh, certainly there are big issues around whether we mean eradicating poverty or extreme poverty or what kind of poverty. And I think that, you know, we will communicate better on that. It, it is um, something that uh, man or woman in, in the street and certainly in my country, whether you try to define poverty as extreme, ab abject or absolute, as far as they're concerned, they're poor. Um, and they need to get off that, uh, that, that baseline. Um, the inequality question, going beyond opportunity, we're hearing. Um, and I think that uh, we, we will need to do more on this uh, to respond to some of the concerns that are there. Um, very quickly, the, um, global, the global partnership on financing. We really did have a huge discussion on this. And we did talk about what needs to come behind a compact that really does change the way we do business and a partnership. And then we went very quickly to partnerships which sort of look at the innovative way that we can tackle um, much of the agenda that is far bigger when you talk to sustainable development beyond just a social poverty agenda that uh, ODA has dealt with. Um, and I think that is still a work in progress, so much more work to do. Um, that again, I hope that we will clarify as we go forward the major concern about how is this process of so many intergovernmental streams going to uh, bring convergence um, by 2015. Uh, I think one thing we have done is begun to talk to one development agenda uh, which looks at people and planet. The rest is uh, we hope to give you much more coherence and direction as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and thank you all for uh, keeping so brilliantly to time. It's, I think I've never chaired an event which has not gone off track at this point. Um, now I'm very conscious that you've had a very long day in Nairobi and I know that Betty you have to leave soon um, so I'm going to go quickly to the first round of questions um, I'm going to go to first to Dakar then to Bogota then to Nairobi and then back here to London and can I just ask um, what we got we'll try and do two rounds of questions um, so each place will get two opportunity two goes but can I just ask that this first round, anyone who has a burning question to put specifically to Betty, um, can you make that, that make that a priority in selecting the question so that we get the opportunity to hear from her again before she um, has to leave us? So Deb, uh, let me go back to you now in Dhaka for some questions from the, your other colleagues there. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, you can hear me? Perfectly. Okay. No, I, I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues who have made those responses and the presentations. Here in Dhaka, let me first bring in uh, Farah. She represents uh, Action Aid. Uh, well, I don't know how much it is a question, how much is it's an observation. It's up to her to formulate it in the right way. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, while we appreciate the report and the concerted effort of the panel, uh, there's still concerns in our mind, and uh, one of the questions we, uh, or a number of questions actually are popping up in my head, and I don't know how much time Dave is going to give me. Mainly what we felt is that uh, we keep talking about eradicating poverty, and uh, we've talked about, in, uh, there is mention of inequality, uh, but we would like to emphasize that the, how are you going to prevent poverty? We have seen that new ki kinds of poverty has been created by corporates by, uh, uh, in the name of new technology, looking for biofuel, moving the food, uh, uh, impacting on the food security of the most vulnerable. So basically what I'm trying to understand is how are we going, this report going to make suggestions on preventing poverty and therefore also looking at the issue of inequality of opportunities. 
and the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable countries. My second question is, we see in goal two, the reference to empowerment of women, and there's a section suggesting that there'll be an emphasis on women inheriting poverty. Something that CEDO has not managed to achieve, neither has MDG been able to improve uh, to the extent or sufficiently adequately on women's, uh, in terms of women's equality and equity. Uh, how does this uh, panel think we will be able to move uh, post-2015 in situations like this? What will be the enforcement binding mechanism? I know this report is all about voluntary contribution, agreement, but I think it's time we talk a little bit about binding mechanisms. Thank you, Farah. Uh, Clear. shall I check uh, my coll other colleagues now, or you will give us opportunity later? There will be one more opportunity, but if your colleagues have very quick questions that they'd like to direct particularly to Betty, because she has to leave, then um, this is your moment. Okay, I'm giving it to Mustafiz. Thank you. I would like to appreciate the contribution of the high-level panel. Uh, my question relates to the issue of coherence, and we have seen how MDG 8 was weak in terms of attaining the, the goals. So may, by, I, my question is that, uh, uh, that for example, uh, for, uh, the, there are a number of issues in, in, in the WTO, for example, the movement of natural persons, uh, uh, remittance is a major uh, factor in terms of poverty alleviation in many of the low-income countries. And there are questions of whether to allow uh, movement of natural persons in the, in the WTO negotiations are going on. How do we ensure that these global uh, uh, ambitions in terms of MDG, post-MDGs, will, will have uh, uh, positive implications uh, with regard to the negotiations that we are having, for example, in the WTO. So this will be one. The second is when we are talking about the global, you know, the compact. Uh, how do you ensure the the the, the, the that uh, the, the along the value chains, all the actors are supportive of of the attaining of the goals. For example, coming from Bangladesh, ready-made garments is a major um, uh, export-oriented industry in our country. Now we, we have international buyers. How do you compel? Or, or encourage the international buyers to give better, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, prices and 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 to also ensure that they also take part in the compliance insurance in in, in our in in our in our factories. So, how do you ensure that the, all the players along the value chain are also uh, partners in this global com compact? Thank you. Well, Claire, as you can see, the questions are all about uh, the coordination linkages synergy and enforcement on specific areas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let me go quickly now to Philip in Bogota. Um, is there anything else bearing in mind that we're particularly looking for questions for Betty here at this moment or things that touch on her presentation? Uh, no, if Betty wants to answer her questions, we can go. Uh, we have two questions here that are not directed to her, Claire. Thank you very much for your forbearance. Um, given that in Nairobi you've just had a full day of um, already talking to Betty, let me quickly go to this London audience who've been very patient here um, and ask if there's anyone here who has anything particular they want to raise with Betty while she's in the room. Then we'll give her a, qu a chance to. Um, then we'll give her a chance to answer. Then we'll go back to you, Philip, um, for any other questions from from Bogota. Sounds good. Okay. We need um, a microphone. So Bernadette here. Mm -hmm. Bernadette, please. David. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Bernadette Fischler from Carford and Beyond 2015. I have a question specifically to Betty, um, based on her background representing um, businesses in Kenya. Um, we had a lot of conversations about the importance of small businesses and micro businesses. Um, and um, their integration in national um, economic policies. And I would like to hear from Betty her reflections, how she sees this um, not or somehow integrated in the high-level panel report and um, how she would recommend maybe going forward which areas to further emphasize in order to make sure that um, all economic strategies, and when we talk about equitable economies, we're not just talking about 
big businesses and multilaterals and transnational corporations, but we're really also talking about the, those businesses where people in poverty are actually mostly to be found, which also includes the informal sector, but maybe that's a going too far already for one question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Over here. Who's doing the... Hi, thank you very much. Um, well, following the uh, the particular... Do you want to start, <coughs> can you just introduce yourself? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Sylvia Beals from Hellpage International, <coughs> based in London. Um, <coughs> uh, sorry, I've got a cough. Um, in relation to Betty's particular field on uh, business, um, we're aware in our work on ageing that the contributions older people make to economies, to the formal and informal economy are very large. Uh, we are a bit concerned, as I think you will know, that age is not uh, consistently referred to in, in the report. And But Betty did make the point about um, age as well as disability and gender as a cross-cutting issue which we welcome and would like to see that more referenced uh, in the final report of the Secretary General, but it would be really good to hear from Betty her view about how all ages, and in particular the contributions that older people make at the community level, can be strengthened via this, um, you know, via, via the framework, and how this can be fully recognised specifically in the targets and the indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have a question here, Betty, that you also might be interested in from um, Richard Kimboa, who is a program manager at the Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development that's come in over the, um, from the live stream. He says the report talks about transformation. He wants to know from what to what in terms of this transformation, which I think is an excellent question for all of us to reflect on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Betty, let me give you a chance to come back on those, and I'll also invite the other panellists to come back on um, any, of the th any of the questions they particularly want to comment on. And then, as I say, we will go back straight to Bogota for another round of questions, to start the next round of questions there. So, Betty, over to you. Oh. Th thank, you. thank you very much. We, we were hoping you would also take some questions from the Nairobi audience. I'm very happy to do so if you, can, if you feel you've got time to take them and then answer the questions. I just thought because they'd had a day with you, they might have got a chance to talk already, but please do. Well, um, well fine. I, I'll take these questions, but it's, I, mean, I think for the next round, they probably want to uh, participate uh, as well. And then the bigger question, I think, from, uh, the, from Action Aid in Bangladesh about preventing, uh, preventing poverty. I think when we talk about leaving no one behind and being as inclusive, it also talks, I mean, the eradication of poverty is also dealing with the conditions that lead to, to poverty. You cannot eliminate them. You, know, you cannot eliminate poverty if you don't eliminate those conditions. So the expansion, for instance, of the agenda to include peace and conflict is a recognition that you cannot have development and you cannot have poverty eradication without uh, stable societies, without accountable, accountable governments and, uh, and accountable institutions. So that all uh, entire ex expansion of the of the agenda means that you are able to handle poverty. The inclusion of uh, proposals on energy, uh, for instance or promotion of an, an infrastructure. And uh, it's, a, it's an indication that we need to create the conditions through which people can find employment, can find, uh, can find and grow, grow jobs. So there's an expanded agenda in that regard. Basically, I mean, I think the argument of the panel is one of the core ways of eliminating poverty through economic growth and economic, uh, economic, economic um, Development. So that, I think, is my answer. I, in that one, we can take that. Um, I'm sure we can respond a little bit more um, later. On the question of coordination and, uh, and the sad, sad experience of MDG 8, we recognize that. And I think the panel was very clear that we need to be quite ambitious 
in this regard and actually call for a new global partnership. I think that there has to be a recognition that the partnership is not just about, you know, about aid, but there's a lot more things and there's a lot more that can, that, that there's a lot more resources that we can draw, we can draw on. So there will be responsibilities uh, for all actors. There is responsibilities for all different, different countries, whether developed or non-developed. There's a lot of course, if you look at the, the, the enabling environment, uh, goal 12, there are actually goals on say reduction of emissions and, uh, and, and, and reduction of CO2, which is totally the responsibility of a lot of developed, developed countries. So we're calling on that. In another conversation, it has been suggested that the Secretary General or might, be, might establish uh, a peer reference group that uh, presents a report on global partnership every five years or so, some eminent people that can at least track how people are remaining uh, committed. So that for us, uh, is, is part of that enhanced uh, global global partnership. But the panel was also very clear that this is not uh, an agenda to be applied only at the global level. There must be a national action, and it should be the responsibility of, you know, of national actors to ensure that their governments are remaining accountable and are, and, and, and are targeting resources through the budget and other means to uh, dealing with this, uh, this, 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 this main, this main item. So there will be also local action, and therefore, the coordination of local action will probably be through the national development plans and national accountability, accountability um, systems. Um, on the question about business, I'm afraid the connection was not terribly clear. So I, 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 I deduce that you were interested whether there is a role for small business as compared to the multinationals as well. The, the business and the private sector we talk about is you know, the wide private sector as it's construed from informal sector to large uh, multinationals. But I think the, the panel was clear that uh, business has to be part of the solution to, 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 to development. And, and, uh, and it has been a great example and mover when it came to sustainable uh, development issues and a lot of all, a lot of the technologies and climate change responses has been led has been led by business, albeit uh, you know there be there be large multinationals, but they set an example for local businesses. But multinationals were also called upon to expand their supply chains and to involve more entrepreneurs and more enterprises in uh, in developing. Uh, country. So it is possible. I mean, no multinational cannot do this by themselves. They have to link up uh, with smaller, smaller business. But they will also be expected to be adopting a reporting standard that indicates their impact on poverty and their impact and, and their own contribution uh, to, 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 to this development and to the work of, uh, of the new development um, agenda. Um, on the question of age, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't understand it very much, but I think we understood you to be asking how we're going to make sure that aged populations are also accounted for. Um, the call in um, transformative uh, agenda number one of living, I can call it for a lot of disaggregation. Uh, reductions, uh, reductions of inequality will only uh, come through um, understanding of the impact on various groups and one of the disaggregate points is on the question uh, on the question of age and I think that is where we would probably capture you notice that the report calls for a data a data revolution and a, and a desire to gather as much information as possible about the impact of initiatives on different socioeconomic groups and basically just collect a lot more more, 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 more data. That will be critical in understanding how it is impacting various populations, and we can find out whether, really, if poverty has been eradicated, is it just for girls or is it just for boys? Is it just? And there, there'll be lots that I think we can be able to to capture. So our vision is that there'll be this will be cut at the level of um, uh, disaggregation. Uh, on the question of transformation of uh, economies, that the, 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 the panel pretty much argued that the economic models that we are using in various economies are not leading to expansion in, uh, in job creation, 
and an, enter an, an enterprise. So uh, when it comes to, I think each country will have to work out what transformation means for their, for their economy. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we talk about more manufacturing and more, more value addition. Um, I think in other, in, in other countries, that the emerging economies that talk about sustaining their growth path, diversifying their, 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 their growth path. So it will be, that is an interpretation at, at national level, but we certainly know that if you're not enjoying significant growth in the economy, you're not able to mobilize the necessary uh, resources to be able to employ as many people in that economy. Of course, that there, there's a requirement for transformation. So that is much more of a locally, I mean, nationally uh, developed uh, plan. But the, 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 view of the, of the, the view of the panel is that we must transform in a manner that expands job opportunities and good, decent jobs language that has been you know that, that has been used in, in in the report including capturing in, in statistics how many new jobs are created for which uh, which which particular which particular group so i hope i've captured i mean i hope i've answered some of the questions that is the from what we could understand or get from uh, from 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 all, from from all of them thanks very much Thank you very much indeed, and thank you uh, for being with us today. I know you have to leave a little early, so let me thank you now. Um, David and Amina, let me offer you an opportunity to come back on any of those questions, and then we'll have another round of questions in all of the different locations. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, well, Betty's response, I think, covered nearly all of the angles, but I'll, I'll pick up on a few of the, the contentious issues that were raised. Firstly, uh, it's clear that income inequality is, is, is something that a lot of people are talking about. And it's certainly something that a lot of people on the panel talked about. I was involved in, in many discussions at, um, at my level, at, at advisor level, about how, how the panel might, might address this issue. So it's the first thing to say is that it's been considered very hard uh, by the panel. The second thing is some of the proposals that, that that were out there uh, and discussed in the panel, such as maybe we could construct a target around the Gini coefficient, maybe we could have one for the Palmer coefficient, didn't really gain any consensus. And partly that's because nobody, could, nobody felt able to define exactly what the right Gini coefficient is for, for all countries, or even to say what, what it might be. But it's also because um, there's a genuine disagreement about, about how best to tackle the relationship between growth and poverty. And that's where a lot of people came out is that really what we need to do is make sure that the relationship between growth and the incomes of the very poorest is a strong one. Um, poverty elasticity, which is what economic, e economists co um, talk about. So, um, and the panel didn't go into indicators. It, it, we did goals, we did targets, and we didn't do indicators. There was some discussion about whether we should even do goals and targets. Um, but, but obviously there's going to be a big process, a big technical process over the next couple of years to develop indicators for the framework. And um, it might be that, that uh, an indicator similar to the one that the World Bank has adopted on poverty elasticity, which is about measuring the relationship between the bottom, the, the incomes or wealth, but I think it's incomes that the bank is focusing on, of the bottom two quintiles and how that relates to the mean, uh, changes and, and that could be a very powerful way of expressing that concept. What the panel felt was most relevant at a target level was all the stuff I was talking about earlier about leaving nobody behind, focusing on zero poverty and lifting the very poorest up. There's a target in there on national poverty lines which is about countries deciding on well what, what does each country want to say about inequality and poverty and then we can you know that, that should be brought into the framework. Um, uh, and and um, and also this concept that, that nobody uh, or no target should be considered met unless it's met by the very poorest people in the society, which I think, as I said, was very powerful. Just a very uh, brief word on a couple of other issues. Um, uh, a couple of um, the, the points made in Dakar were about um, business and, and, the, and the role of um, corporations in, in the framework. And I think, I think there are three tests uh, around what the panel's proposing. And, and firstly, it's actually, does this framework work for business? Does this create the kind of environment that will enable businesses to drive growth and poverty eradication and sustainable development? Uh, secondly, 
uh, is it is it relevant for businesses in what they want to do? Businesses do have a social role. So businesses that want to create jobs, businesses that do want to, to have a role in the community, is this something that they can, they can adopt? And then thirdly, does it hold businesses to account? I'm sure it's not perfect, but I think that it passes uh, all three of those tests to some degree, and that's a huge difference compared to where we were with the MDGs. And then lastly, Claire, if you'll allow me, uh, one of the questions was uh, how does uh, the panel propose in its report to, to um, prevent poverty? Well, I think there's actually a big story on that, uh, and it's something that the British Prime Minister was very keen to get into the panel report, but it, he was far from alone. Uh, uh, many panel members were very keen to, to address issues that can be seen as causes of poverty, or if you like, enablers of getting out of poverty. And that very strong agenda around justice, around growth, um, around giving people a voice, around property rights so that, so that individuals and communities or small businesses can uh, have, have secure assets, uh, around transparency and accountability and tackling corruption. I think that's a very big story on, on tackling the cause of poverty. Thank you. A golden thread, one might say. One might say that. <laughs> thank you, Amina. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think um, just one thing as, as a caution to all of this, the report itself and input into a much larger process. And so I think taking the opportunities of what's not quite there and will reinforce what comes along. And I think that those expectations, um, we need to keep the momentum um, and, and keep it high as possible, um, but, but allude to some of them. And I, and I take, for example, the issues around the aged. I think one thing came up very early in the discussions of the report. We were talking, seeing and hearing about the youth bulge and that was of great concern to us, the jobs that are needed and livelihoods and um, making sure that we, we use that energy in the future. But, uh, you know, then come the statistics. What about the age? If this, is going to, if this is for everybody, how are we going to contain this? And it, health was discussed, education was discussed, economic empowerment, um, that it is different in different places with the universal ad agenda, what you do, the aged in the north or, the, or Southeast Asia or Africa, all very different. And I think um, the granular detail of how we attend to that uh, will come in work and I think keep the momentum. We've opened that door now. Um, and also I think to say that, you know, we have a 15-year agenda. So you're not going to, to put in 50 years into, 50 into 15 years. I think we have also to try to, um, I don't want to say prioritize because I don't want to exclude anything or anybody, but there will be a certain amount that we can achieve over time. Um, and I think that that's what we, we need to, to do. Um, I think there's a lot of questions about how do you ensure, how are you going to compel, how are you going to make things happen, tell us what you're going to do. Um, you know, the development agenda that comes like, like the one that's gone by is not legally uh, binding. What it's going to have to do is to raise that um, ambition and open the door for the advocacy that we can mobilize and galvanize better than we did with the MDGs, and the MDGs did go far um, to do this. And so I think that some of the things that give us comfort, certainly putting in there up front and center the governance issue that will strengthen institutions and voice and deepen democracy and, and look at how one gets access uh, to justice uh, to, to reinforce women's rights and, and make that a much stronger voice at the country level is an important part of ensuring this agenda happens. But so too the new players that we have. Um, and we have to define um, and develop those relationships from civil society to government when we talk about parliamentarians and when we talk about business. Um, and not leave it just to business and government or to parliamentarians as one arm of government. It's how we engage them and use them um, for, for, the, for the interests of people. Um, and then very quickly, I, I think, uh, to the question on, um, on the transformation, you know, what's what transformation from what to what? And this is a big transformation, first of all, to a social agenda to one of sustainable development. Um, I don't know anything that's larger than that that hasn't been talked about for decades and that now we've put front and center. I don't think we can go back. Um, it's transformative that we're not talking north to south. We're saying everybody around the table is involved in this and there will be different responsibilities. And, and yes, we keep the, the uh, partnership but and, and, and add more to it, but it is about everyone now. I think those are two very big ones. Um, second, um, that we are talking about an economic transformation that puts people at the center, but also considers that we have to have a balance on that footprint and really look at the issues of consumption and production and that we can't just ignore them as something that's going to happen in somebody else's lifetime. I think this is also a big one. Um, whenever we had governance on the agenda in this way, that's a transformative uh, you know, shift that uh, really hasn't happened before. And we have got huge hurdles to climb for that. This is no mean feat to try to make that happen. We tried to be individual in the panel, but I can 
tell you the few uncomfortable individuals as they remembered they were in government, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because this goes forward into that domain, and, and I hope we will be able to keep that. And last but not least, we are recognizing we need, first of all, to keep ODA on the agenda. Um, uh, second, that we will need um, more uh, means of implementation, but a genuine global partnership that will make uh, go past the glo uh, goal, goal eight, for which we didn't do so well, and, and very specific about that. And I think that that's going to be challenged by thinking, if you think how hard it was to get ODA just for the social agenda when we were advocating off the back of poverty and misery, now we're going to be asking business and people to do this. It won't be off the back of poverty and misery. Yes, that will be part of the agenda, but it has to be opportunity. Um, it's going to be just as difficult to get those tools to access sovereign wealth funds or um, illicit um, uh, flows of, 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 of capital as it was to get the ODA, if, e if not even more difficult. So shift of resources from one part to another, and that's always never going to come as a free lunch. Thank you very much indeed. Um, vast amount to be getting on with there. Quickly, another, I think we're going to manage to squeeze in another round of questions. So let me quickly turn to... I'm going to do uh, ask Bogota first for questions from you, then Nairobi, then any last points from Dhaka and London, and then we'll have quick responses and finish in the next half an hour or so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so over to you, Philip. Hello. Claire, yes, we have two specific questions here. One is from Professor Juana Garcia from the University of the Andes and Wendy Arenas from the Alisos organization here in Colombia. So I will turn to them. Uh, this question is going to Amina. Uh, is how is going to the private sector get involved, be involved in these new universal goals? Not only the big corporations, also the small enterprises. Uh, how how it is going to be involved all the actors and how is going to be the coordination between all the actors and stakeholders? Hello to everyone. Uh, I, I think um, my question would be addressed to the panels, but maybe I mean as well, uh, concerning her last comment on, on the transformation question, from where to where. Um, we believe that it's been a great effort of including comments around the world and, and shifting and moving the agenda from ODMs to sustainable development goals. However, uh, reading it thoroughly very quickly the, the, this report, we still have the feeling that sustainability is a very a weak concept and the concept of social agenda is much stronger. And there isn't a, a definition really of what there, uh, we think or the, pro, uh, the report means about development. It seems that it's in a very conventional way in terms of GDP, uh, uh, income, and there's a sense of urgency where concepts like biocapacity or resilience are not really strongly emerging in the report. And there's a concern that it's the green agenda has, hasn't permeate too much into uh, the ODMs. And I think that the transition and building up these two agendas, putting the, the agendas of sustainable development goals and ODMs uh, beyond 2015, I would think and I believe that the green agenda should emerge more. I think it's a great effort of including a consumption patterns, a climate change, but certainly those issues are not enough. There's, there's a huge uh, range of issues concerning natural resources, biodiversity, that they don't appear. And I would lust, just like to make a comment. I think a, I agree that including business as, as a key actor to sustainable development is important, but one would like to see more specific uh, definitions of, of their, their role concerning, a more na in, in, concerning more the environment and natural resources. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just remind everybody, um, before you speak, it's really helpful to introduce your, uh, just your name and organization. Philip, I know you did that for the, um, our two colleagues from Bogota at the beginning, but... Um, over to you now in, is that, have you got any more questions, Philip, from any of your colleagues there no. in Bogota? No, this is all for now. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much indeed. Let me turn straight to Nairobi. Um, any questions, please, from your audience there? Hello, everybody. This is Irungo Houghton uh, here in Nairobi. I had two quick questions. Um, 
uh, which relates to the implementation uh, that came up in our session here early this morning. One um, question was uh, really, you know, the, the, the document provides a new vision and a transformatory agenda, as we've said, but there is a lot of past listening for um, how things should be, and there's some anxiety here that um, this vision that contained in this document might either get diluted, diluted or um, uh, sidestepped by uh, processes either within the G77 or within the Open Working Group. So the question we would like to ask is what must be done between June and September to really enroll and to inspire uh, the world's leadership to uh, rally behind this and ensure that this document doesn't uh, get, uh, you know, as I say, diluted. The, the second question relates to the issue of inequality. And um, a, colleague, a couple of colleagues this morning spoke about uh, the importance um, of fixing the missing, which was within the uh, MDGs, and that related to the rights-based approach and how they were disappointed not to see clear legal frameworks um, and entitlements and the possibility of single goal. Earlier on, you spoke about the... Um, uh, the uh, integrity of the document, that it actually carries the vision of the hundreds of thousands of people that were involved in this process, but it does not seem that the uh, inequality uh, global conversation and the spirit of that conversation has found itself into that document. I wondered whether, Amina, you'd like to address uh, these two points. Thank you, Iwungu. Any more questions from, from you in Nairobi? We have two more questions from Please Nairobi. go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Waragoro from the International Federation of Medical Students Association. My question is specific to the suggested goal number four, where it's um, ensuring healthy lifestyles. Um, and the targets suggested are the MDGs um, and an addition of sexual and reproductive health and also an addition of, um, of NCDs. Um, my question, however, is why the panel decided to go this way? Because based on the consultations in Botswana in March on health, um, and based on all the conversations in the health world, there's, a, there's been a recognition that siloing health issues such as HIV or maternal mortality does not address health issues universally. And the health issues or the health targets suggested in the report seem to be the MDGs repeated. And also they seem to be focused on low-income um, low countries and they don't deal with inequity, especially in high-income countries. So my question in short would be why the, why the panel decided to go the MDG plus way and not focus on a broader goal that will involve everyone, such as universal health care, which is where the health discussions, even in the recently concluded World Health Assembly, is going. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and my name is Eureka Last from Handicap International. I would like to add on the concerns uh, on inequality. From the work we are doing, the data we have, disaggregated data is not enough to follow, so we would like to join in and ask for a specific inequality goal because we need for those groups, not only for persons with disability, but also women due to ascribed roles, etc. We need specific actions um, to redress previous discrimination so that they really can equalize their opportunities to participate and pre in resilience, but also prevent po poverty. And the question to the panel or people who have been involved in the wider discussions is, do you think an inequality goal is, uh, is, is feasible, as in shifting from only a gender inequality goal to have a general inequality goal. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me come back to this very patient audience in London now for some questions. And then, Deb, I don't know if any of your colleagues have um, anything more to add, but we'll go back to you afterwards if so. And then I believe that will probably be it. We'll see how we go. Okay, I saw David first. 